Okay, to continue on the theme of physical economy, creativity, and science as the common aims of man, our next presentation will be from uh, Megan Brulard, a researcher for 21st century science and technology. And she's going to speak on the subject of Vernadsky's Noosphere, the scientific and spiritual basis for the new paradigm. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been a very, I think it's been a very exciting day so far. From hearing from, it was so exciting to hear from representatives of all of the BRICS nations, as well as more from Rachel and Helga on what this BRICS perspective actually is and the new potential that it represents for mankind. Um, but this afternoon, we have heard about some of the an example of some of the real crises, scientific crises facing mankind. For example, the threat of deadly pandemics like, like Ebola. And I think this really points to the fact that the BRICS nations or any nation who really realizes the failure of this old paradigm and wants to create a, a real future for mankind has to actually define their principles on a scientific basis which can can meet some of these great challenges. And I'd like to initially just just think a little bit more about this this threat of pandemics such as such as Ebola. Um, so I'd like to start actually with um, the, the first slide has a quote um, which I'll read from a, a really fascinating paper written by economist Lyndon LaRouche. This is something he wrote years ago. Um, and it's called The Role of Economic Science in Projecting Pandemics. And what he goes through in this paper, it, uh, you know, it points to the nature of the problem and I think begins to actually get at the solution, which I want to continue to discuss today, which I do think is really exemplified in the work of, in the work of Vladimir Vernadsky, which very mu much overlaps which, with Lyndon LaRouche's ideas about physical economy. So what LaRouche says in this paper, the, the general thing that he's discussing, he says, when you have economic collapse, the prevalence of deadly pandemics will actually increase, in a sense, this being a forecast. And he referred to this in terms of what this phenomenon is, is a descent to, to lower forms of life generally. So he poses the question, this is what's here, he says, society is an integral part of the biosphere both as a whole and regionally, what happens when a biological system, such as a society, falls entropically to a lower level of existence? What happens is that lower forms of life consume human and other higher forms of life as fuel for their own proliferation. So I think this is, it's certainly thought-provoking, interesting, and I think very principled way of actually looking at what a pandemic is, that it's lower forms of life coming to dominate higher forms of life. Now the, the language, some of the language that, which is actually used here, for example, the term biosphere, this comes from someone, uh, one of my favorite people really, who I want to introduce you to a little bit today in the brief time I have, it's a Russian-Ukrainian scientist named Vladimir Vernadsky, and he actually coined this term, which people might have heard, this term the biosphere. Now, in his language, he would probably say, he also coined another term, that this is an example of the biosphere dominating the noosphere. Um, so you have really a, a, a similarity in terms of language and idea between LaRouche's concept of physical economy and Vernadsky's, Vernadsky's work on the biosphere and noosphere, not just term, in terms of language, but in terms of idea, because in both of these cases, um, both of these, both of these people, LaRouche and Vernadsky, would actually say that this is wrong. If you, if you're in a situation where the biosphere is uh, is dominating the noosphere, um, this case of pandemics, you know, consuming human and other forms of life as fuel for their own proliferation, that this is actually wrong. So I want to explore this 
idea a little bit of the biosphere, the noosphere, through the personality of Vernadsky, because I think it, it really gives us a, a very important uh, perspective with, with which we can think about some of these problems and, and actually think about the, uh, really the potential of mankind. So I want to introduce you to him a little bit. So if you could go to the next slide. Vernadsky is, uh, here's a picture. This is actually a 21st century science and technology recently published two volumes in honor of Vernadsky's 150th birthday of articles, translations, writings of his. You can, you can look up this book on Amazon. And you can also go to larouchepack.com slash Vernadsky. We have a, LaRouche Pack has a Vernadsky project, and you can find a lot more of his writings and things there. And I'm going to, I think one of the best ways for me to introduce him to people is through his own words. So he was Russian, Ukrainian. He lived during this period, 1863 to 1945. And his he's really a, really a renaissance man. His life's work spanned many domains of investigation, from the study of non-life. He did a very extensive study of crystals, a study of soil, which he, in his language, he would not call this living matter per se. He would call it inert living matter. So crystals, soil. Then just the study of life much more broadly and coming to the idea of not just life in terms of aggregate of you know, individual organisms which he studied, but this idea, this term which he coined, the biosphere of life as a power to, which actually has and continues to transform the surface of the planet. And then as, you know, something which was always in his studies, but which really uh, he, he got more and more excited about, towards the end of his life is what he referred to as the noosphere, which is then the way in which mankind, the way in which human cognition and human creativity has transformed the surface of the earth. And in his view, you know, when this is done in a, a, cer a certain approach to this, this, this is right. This is actually... Um, this is a principle of, of development which is correct. Um, and so he discovered that between these different uh, spheres of, of power, you could say, the biosphere, the noosphere, and the domain of non-living, the lithosphere, that there is actually a, a hierarchy there. The noosphere actually being the greatest, uh, having the greatest potential to create change on for example, most clearly, you know, we're beginning to move out to other planets, but on the surface of the Earth. So just to give you a, a little bit of an example of how he thought about the biosphere, and then, you know, getting towards the noosphere. So he looked at how life transformed the surface of the planet. Um, the biosphere's contribution, for example, to the creation of new minerals on Earth. On Earth, we have 4,400 different kinds of minerals. Now, over half of these would not exist if it weren't for life. In a sense, they're, they're derived through various ways because of photosynthesis, because of the oxygen atmosphere, which we have here on Earth, which is the result of photosynthesis. So that if you, if you think about that, 4,400 minerals on Earth, over half of them, the majority of them, would not exist if it weren't for life. That's a clear, uh, sort of a clear, concise example of the idea of the biosphere and its power to transform the surface of the Earth. So then Vernadsky studied, you know, and really became a, sort of fascinated with this idea of how human cognition does this in a similar way, but actually in a more powerful way. And there's something paradoxical about that too which we'll get into. So he, in terms of the noosphere, he said, you know, maybe one of the first clear expressions of this, he said, could, would perhaps be human agriculture in terms of, you know, this is tens of thousands of years ago. If you think of agriculture, this is man's large, really large scale transformation of, of the surface of the earth. He, you know, wrote about the fact that something else typical of man, early man, is his use of fire. Um, and so, you know, in this same vein, and also uh, it's sort of an analogy or, or to 
reflect back on how this compares with the idea of the biosphere. So I mentioned the majority of the Earth's minerals come from life. But he, he comments on and reflects on the fact that human creativity also has a very interesting relationship to this question of the creation of new minerals. He said mankind is able to produce by the ton uh, and I, you know, minerals, minerals which are found in very small amounts naturally or things that he actually creates. He's able to produce these things by the ton and ironically, this is achieved by a force which has no weight, you know, it's, it, and it has no energy to speak of. And he says this is really fascinating that you could have something which has no manifestation of really matter or energy, but which can, is, can be such a powerful transformative force on the surface of the earth. So what I'd like to do is just um, read for people uh, some of Vernowski's thoughts, some of his own words on, on this idea of the noosphere, um, which, which really is a, it's a conception of, of mankind and what mankind is in a principled way. So if you could show the next slide. So this is Vernowski on the noosphere. It's from one of his last writings. It's called Some Words on the Noosphere. So he writes, how can thought change material processes? Here, a new riddle has arisen before us. Thought is not a form of energy. How then can it change material processes? That question has not as yet been solved. As for the coming of the noosphere, we see around us at every step the empirical results of that incomprehensible process. That mineralogical rarity, native iron, is now being produced by the billions of tons. Native aluminum, which never before existed on our planet, is now produced in any quantity. The same is true with regard to the countless numbers of artificial chemical combinations, which he calls biogenic cultural minerals, which are newly created on our planet. So just to explore this a little bit more, I want to actually read just two more quotes from him, if you could go to the next page, just to let this idea of, of the noosphere sink in. So this is from another paper he wrote called Problems of Biogeochemistry Two. So he says, in this geological process, which is fundamentally biogeochemical, a single individual unit of living matter out of the totality of humanity a great personality, whether a science, scientist, an inventor, or a statesman, can be of fundamental, decisive, directing importance and can manifest himself as a geological force. This sort of manifestation of individuality in processes of enormous biogeochemical importance is a new planetary phenomenon. So you have this scientist who studied every, he studied every kind of phenomenon there is on Earth, and he's really, you can imagine him sort of standing with awe before the great power that he sees, the great potential that he sees in mankind as a, as a, as a force for change, which, which he sees as something which can be very, uh, can be something very positive. Um, so just one more quote here. This is from a paper an earlier paper he wrote um, called On Human Autotrophy. So he says, there exists now on the terrestrial surface a great geological force. This force does not seem to be a new manifestation or special form of energy, nor even a pure and simple expression of known energy. But it exerts a profound and powerful influence on the course of energetic phenomena on the Earth's surface and consequently has repercussions smaller but undeniable beyond the surface. On the existence of the planet itself, this force is human reason, the directed and controlled will of social man. So one of the, I think, amazing things about Vernazky is that he, and also a, an irony, um, a sort of a tension which is present in the situation today is he came to this discovery about what he saw as a, a, a powerful and optimistic potential of mankind 
he really came to this discovery as mankind was involved in World War II, you know, in, a, in something, in something very destructive. Yet he said he he said he was resolute in his confidence that this idea of the noosphere and this process of the noosphere, of mankind working together, collaborating to create, to transform the surface of the earth, really to, to continue to support that process of mankind. That even though he came to this discovery in the middle of World War II, he had, he had confidence that mankind would, would, would move forward um, and that this idea would come into fruition. So if you could go to the next slide. So this is something he wrote, yeah, in 1943, and and he died. You know, he didn't really, uh, you know, he did, he wasn't able to see the future of his idea after the war. But he wrote in 1943. At present, we cannot afford not to realize that in the great historical tragedy through which we live, we have elementally chosen the right path leading into the noosphere. I say elementally as the whole history of mankind is proceeding in this direction. So just to wrap up here, um, in a, <clears throat> so Lyndon LaRouche has said, and I'm actually gonna quote from one of uh, my favorite books of his, which I first picked up here in Boston, something like almost 10 years ago now, a book called Earth's Next 50 Years, which you can actually find outside. He said, and, and this is something he's continued to express, um, is that this idea of universal human creativity expressed as the noosphere, this is the correct scientific, but, but I would also say spiritual basis for, for relations amongst nations. So in this book, The Earth's Next 50 Years, uh, he discussed this interesting question of how do you create a dialogue of cultures? And he said, well, of course, you don't create a dialogue of cultures by, for example, debating which nation has the best religion. That's certainly not a, uh, that's certainly not a productive way to, to resolve that question. You don't have a debate between China and India about whether Buddhism or Hinduism is, is the correct religion. That's, that's not the way to move forward. This won't function. And what he actually says, you know, he, so he presents this as a, um, you know, as, as a challenge, it is an interesting, it is something interesting to think about. How do you create a dialogue of cultures where you're dealing with nations which have different histories, different languages, or at different levels of development? And he says that really the, the basis for such a dialogue of cultures is Vernowski's idea of the noosphere. So I would like to wrap up by reading just a quote from this, it's on the next slide. This is a picture of the book, so you can find it outside on the table. Um, so he says, the best rule of thumb statement, and so this is actually a section of, of this paper called the Vernadsky Remedy. He says, the best rule of thumb statement of solution for the paradox of creating a dialogue of cultures is V.I. Vernadsky's systemic definition of the noosphere. And he says, a rational world would adopt Vladimir Vernadsky's defining of the noosphere as the keystone for defining the physical economic doctrines of management and development of all modern economies. It's quite a statement. So with that, I would like to, like to wrap up and let us, with this idea of, of the noosphere in mind as a way to think about uh, a certain idea of unity of mankind from these diverse cultures and backgrounds, but with a sense of the one single identity and, and purpose mankind of mankind on, on Earth, which is as a great power for, for change and transformation. So with that, I think we can move on, and I think our next speakers will give us more of an idea of some of the tasks, of, tasks for the noosphere um, in the near and distant future. So, Thank you very much.